Bible with you this morning, I would invite you to open it to the book of Acts chapter 2. And as we look at the book of Acts chapter 2 this morning, I want us to think about the model church. I've been asking you if you had a vision for this church. You're the membership. You're the people. Do you have a vision for this church? Do you have a vision for where God wants to lead it? For what God wants it to be? What do you want it to be? Are they compatible? What you want and what God wants? Are they on the same page? Next Sunday, Lord willing, I, I look to bring a message on a vision. But this morning, I want us to see the model church. We're going to look at three different churches this morning. And we're going to decide what kind of a church we want our church to be. What kind of a church God wants our church to be. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4 and 37 to 47. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of far, and it set upon each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now look at verses 37 to 47. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart when they heard Peter's preaching. And said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about three thousand souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily as such as should be saved. I believe that's the Lord's model church. I hope you agree. Because you're not going to find a better picture of God's church anywhere in the New Testament than what you find right here. As we begin this morning, I want us to be very clear about the word church. <laughs> We use the word church oftentimes and we know what we're talking about, but some people misinterpret what we're saying. I'm going to church. I'm going out to the church. I'm going by the church. When in reality what we're saying is, I'm going to the church house. The church is not this building. This building is the church house. It is the house of God for worship, for praise, for fellowship, for instruction in righteousness, as Paul would say. It is the house of God where people, where the church, where the redeemed of God, the children of God, the true born-again believers in Jesus Christ come to worship and praise and honor God and fellowship 
one with another in an atmosphere of a family because we are brothers and sisters in Christ. The question for every church congregation are perhaps twofold. What kind of church does God want our church to be? The second question is, what kind of church do I want our church or my church to be? Sometimes we use those words, my church, but it is not my church. And it really is not our church. It is God's. It is God's. We have no part in ownership because we have been bought with a price. We have been adopted into the family of God. We have been brought into the fold. I want to take you this morning to three New Testament churches. Three churches that really stand out. One is in the early years of Christianity. One, if we understand it correctly, the second one represents the church in a time period before the rapture, before the great tribulation period. It is the church on earth in its final days. And the third is the model church. As we listen this morning, and as God speaks to us through His Spirit's ministry, I want us to ask, God, what kind of church do you want my church, our church, your church to be? God, what kind of a church do I want our church to be? Let's look at the church at Corinth, first of all. The church at Corinth is found throughout the New Testament book of 1 Corinthians. Throughout that whole letter that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, Paul expresses many things about the church at Corinth. It is a church that Paul started. It is a, per a church that Paul worked with. It is a church that really is not very old in years of existence. It is a church not too long after Christ ascended back to the right hand of the Father. It's a church that God didn't smile upon, couldn't look down with favor upon. A church that embarrassed Him church that disgraced him, a church that shamed him. It was a church and churches are plagued by these same problems yet today. And thus they fail to glorify God and basically they just exist to go through the motions. Well, it's Sunday and we do this every Sunday. Plagued, the church at Corinth was plagued by dissensions. There was in that congregation a group of people who said, well, we like Paul. <laughs> there was another group sitting over here who said, we like Apollos. And there's another group sitting over here who said, we like Peter. They were torn by dissension in their membership. Some like their other brother Danny. And brother Danny did a good job. And they don't much care for me. I'll just be honest with you. I've already learned that a long time ago. Some like me better, maybe, than brother Danny. I don't know. I really don't care. Folks, God didn't put Brother Danny here or me here or your next pastor here, whoever he might be, for us to say, well, I like him better than the others. We come to the house of God to worship God. 
And if we focus our attention on somebody else, then we're wrong. If we don't come to the house of God, it's not whether we like the preacher or we don't like the preacher. That's, that's, we'll get to that in a minute. Have we come to hear the word of God? Have we come to study the word of God? Have we come to fellowship with God's people? And most important of all, have we come to worship God? Have we come to fellowship with God? Have we come to say the Spirit of God speak to our hearts? God, bring us closer to you. To worship. There were carnal Christians in the church at Corinth. Babies which for the most part hadn't grown up. Didn't want to grow up. Oh, if they were truly Christians, they made a decision and then, you know, they had one foot over here in the world and the other foot they tried to put in heaven with God. God said, you can't live that way. You can't live that way. Never could, never will be able to. You either are or we aren't. A choice has to be made. The church in Corinth, was plagued by fornication and adultery. Members in the congregation toyed around with the world's concept of sexual pleasures and didn't seem to care. And the congregation in Corinth didn't seem to care enough to do something about it. The church in Corinth there was a lot of disharmony among the members. Some said, I've got this gift. Some said, I've got that gift. And they got in an argument over whose gift was better or more important. Hmm. Some lusted after evil things and things of this world. There was division. There was heresies, the Bible says. Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. There are heresies within the church, false teachings within the church. There was a whole lot of uncommitment. A lot of maybe Christians, maybe not, and a lot of Christians who were not growing up into the Lord. And thus, they were not committed to it. They tried to live with one foot in the world and one foot with God, and you can't do that. Jesus said, you're either for me or you're against me. It's as simple as that. It's as simple as a line drawn out there, and we got to choose. We can't straddle the line. God says, I won't tolerate that. I won't accept that. They dishonored God, that church at Corinth. They shamed God. They gave a witness to the world that you could be a Christian and live any way you wanted to live. And God said, no, no. That's one example of a church in the New Testament. Let me give you a second example of a church in the New Testament. It's the church of the Laodiceans in Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 to 22. Many believe that this is the church of the last age before the rapture of Christ, before the great tribulation period. This is that period of time, that last few years, however long it may be, and we may be in it right now. I don't know. But this is how the church is going to be in the end times of the church age. Paul said, in Revelation 3.15, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. And in 16, he said, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Cold meant that they continued to reject Christ's lordship. They were unmoved by the gospel. Hot meant that they were spiritually alive. They sought to worship God. They sought to put the Lord Jesus Christ in His proper space and to worship Him and honor Him with their lives. But God said they are lukewarm. You are lukewarm, He said. They don't openly reject the gospel. 
they attend church, they profess to know Jesus, but they're hypocrites playing games with God and the world. That's what God meant by being lukewarm. They're just playing around. Oh, you know, it's Sunday morning, we ought to go to church. Well, if that's the only reason for going to church, then you come for the wrong reason. We go to church to worship God, and if we don't go to church to worship God, we're wasting our time, folks. And we're giving a false impression to the world. In the 17th verse, God said, And you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. God said, You don't even understand. You don't even begin to know. You haven't even fathomed the spiritual condition that you are in. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. That's another well-known church in the New Testament period. Now let's go to that model church. Let's go to the book of Acts chapter 2 and let's go to our our text for this morning and see what God's church was like. The passage describes the newborn church in its prime. Jesus has ascended. The apostles have been preaching. The Christians continue to worship, fellowship, praise God, serve the Lord Jesus Christ. The model church in Acts was a church that possessed a purity of devotion to the risen Lord. If they are the model church, what kind of church were they? What kind of church were they? Follow along with me beginning in verse 1. And then we'll go down to verse 37. I got 10 things I want to share with you quickly this morning. Number one, they truly sought to be true followers in and true followers of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Peter's preaching. And when they heard the word of God, they said, what shall we do? He said, repent and be baptized. Now, this isn't going through the motion. This is saying, God, I'm confessing my sin and I'm giving you my heart and my life from here on. Repent and be baptized. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 41 says, They gladly received the word and were baptized and they were added under the church, 3,000 souls that day. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 30, He that is not with me is against me. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. 37, they heard the gospel. They responded to the gospel. In 38, they repented and were baptized. In 41, they followed it all up. Was it for real? Did they really make Jesus Lord of their life? Was there any kind of real change in their lives? Folks, if you read the following verses, the verses that follow, you can't help but see that there was a change in their lives. Let's look at what they did. Number two, they were in harmony with God and with one another. They were in harmony with God and one another. They sought to please God. They sought to honor God. They sought to live as God wanted them to live. And they sought to accept one another, to love one another, and to serve the Lord together, one with another. If you look at verse 1, the word they is there. If you look at 37 to 47, five times that word they is used over and over, and it is implied many more times beside the five that is actually stated they. 
They loved God. They loved one another. They accepted one another. Whoever came in spite of whatever the other person may have looked like, in spite of whatever the other person may have, whatever, they accepted them into the body of Christ and they worked at being one body. Paul speaks in 1 Corinthians 12 about being one body, many members. You know, the Bible says that they were in harmony with God and one another. Some people like to wear their feelings out on their sleeves so that they get brushed easily. That's probably why some people aren't here today. Hmm? Well, somebody, somebody said something and I didn't like it. Did you go to them and talk to them? About, well, no, no, I didn't. Why not? Well, somebody did something I didn't like. These people came together as baptized believers in Christ, as His, as their Lord, and they fellowship. They worked together in harmony to being the people of God in that place. They accepted one another. Well, I don't like the way that guy preaches. Well, maybe you don't. If you came to listen to the preacher, you came for the wrong reason. We ought to come to God's house to hear the Word of God and let the Spirit of God be the one who brings it to us and teaches us in it. Hmm? Well, I don't like the way that person looks. They, they don't quite, you know, they're, they're on the other side of the tracks. They don't quite come up to my status. Well, there's something wrong. The Bible says that these Christians loved one another. They were in harmony one with another. They were in harmony with God. Third, in verse 42, they continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine. Steadfast. They were earnest. They were diligent. They persevered. They were constant in their pursuing the apostles' doctrine. What's the apostles preaching and teaching anyway? Well, they're telling about the things of God in the Old Testament. And they're te telling about the things of God in the New Testament. That's what they're doing. We have three opportunities in this church for the apostles' doctrine or the word of God, if you will, today to be taught. One is Sunday school at 9 o'clock on Sunday morning. Two is the worship service on Sunday morning. And three is Wednesday night. Three opportunities. The Bible says that this, this church, this bunch of believers, this group of people who sought to honor God, they were steadfast in the apostles' doctrine. They wanted to know. They wanted to learn. The church is the place where God's word is taught so Christians will know how God wants us to live. And you know, I haven't learned all that I should have learned through the years, but even if I had, I still got room to grow some more. I don't know, can you say that? You know, I, I could be here for 80 years in the house of God, and I still wouldn't know everything God had set out there for me to know and to learn and to grow to that point of maturity where I'm like the Lord Jesus Christ. That's always the challenge before us. They steadfastly pursued it. The Word of God, the spiritual food that grows us toward maturity in Christ. Number four, in fellowship. Fellowship with Jesus and one another. We talked about that a minute ago. Number five, in breaking of bread. That's the celebration of the Lord's Supper. That's when we come to remember what Jesus has done for us. To be reminded so that we don't forget how precious, at what great price came the salvation of God, the forgiveness of our sins. How God went through that moment when there was darkness over the face of the earth and he turned away from his son who became sin for us. 
and sacrificed his life to pay the penalty. Oh, well, that's not that important either to some people. No, but it was to these Christians. It was to these in the model church. The Bible says number four, number seven and verse 43, and great fear, the fear of God, the reverence of God, putting God first. Understand if we can call ourselves a committed Christian, how we can treat God so irreverently. Well, I don't have to go to church today, I want to do something else. I don't have to do this, I don't have to do that, I don't have to live this way, I don't have to order my language, I don't have to order my affairs in life. Why? Bible says this group of Christians in the model church feared God. They reverenced God. They held God in such a high plateau of respect and worship that they wanted to honor Him with their life. They wanted you know some people want to know if the church is a beautiful place. <laughs> Does that make any difference whether we worship God in it or not? In Wyoming, we started churches in homes. We started churches in school buildings. We started churches in a VFW hall where there was a, 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 a restaurant type thing and we would go in and clean out the beer bar. People came because they wanted to worship God, not because of the looks of the building as the most beautiful place to worship. Oh, I want to go to a church that's comfortable. It's got padded pews. It's got air conditioning. It's got all of the trimmings gone for the wrong reason, haven't we? Gone for the wrong reasons. They went because of the presence of God. The reverence that they had for God. Number 8, 44 to 45. They looked after one another. When they saw a need, they met that need. If they had to dig in their pockets, they did it and they did it gladfully. They didn't expect somebody else to pat them on the back. They didn't run up and down the street and say, look what I did. They just did it because one of their brothers, one of their brothers, one of their sisters was in need. And they had in a way an opportunity to meet that need. They looked after one another. It was more than just saying, I love you. It was the demonstration of that love. That's what it was. And number 9 in verse 46, they continued daily with one accord. They continued daily in fellowship and harmony, in gladness and unity with the Lord and with one another. Number 10, they praised God. They rejoiced in God. God who had saved them from their sin. God who had redeemed them. God who had blessed them. God who had given them the ultimate in the sense of one day being taken up into glory with Him forever. Oh, now consider the results. The Bible says they had favor with all the people. You know there are lots of communities where churches are located that the church doesn't have much favor with the people. Well, those people down there, they, they, just, they just fuss and fight all the time. Those people down there, they're kind of snobbish. They, you know, they only wel welcome certain classes of people or certain colors of people or certain this or certain that. Those people down there, they backbite one another all the time. The Bible says in the model church, they had favor with the people, meaning the community, meaning the people around them. Monroe City, Honeywell, Shelbina. And the Bible says, secondly, the result was the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. In closing this morning, which of these three churches do you think God wants our church to be? 
which of these three churches do you want our church to be? And the question always is before us, as it is before all the people out there on Facebook or whatever who are sitting at home today and could be in the house of the Lord. What kind of church do you want Honeywell Mission Church to be? As God wants it to be? Or as you want it to be? Are we willing to make the kind of commitments that God wants us to make to be like the model church? There are three things in closing this morning. What's it going to take to be like the model church? It means taking and making Jesus Christ the Lord of our lives. He can be nothing less if we are to make Him who He's supposed to be. If we are to make this church be the church that God wants us to be, it has to be because Jesus is the Lord of our lives. Not just in verbal expression, but from the heart. It has to be by faithful attendance. You see what they did? They continued this and they gladly received His word. They, they came together in fellowship. There has to be attendance. And there has to be involvement in and support of our ministry of and to one another. That's the Lord's model church. That's the Lord's model church. I'm not here this morning to preach down to you. But if we come next Sunday night and talk about a vision for this church, where does God want us to be in a few months, six months, a year, two years? Is there any change that we need to make? Is there any change that I need to make in my life? That's what we need to ask ourselves. This church set the example for the kind of church God wants us to be.